It's not easy designing a new helicopter, especially if that helicopter has to survive a ride on a rocket, deploy from the Perseverance rover, and be controlled by these guys 200 million miles away. NASA's Ingenuity is the first machine aerial vehicle to fly on a planet outside Earth. Its more than 500 parts are all designed to meet the challenges of flying on Mars. Ingenuity's been so successful in the past month that it's preparing for even more flights. So why did NASA decide to design a helicopter for Mars? To prove that we can. <laughs> That's a simple answer. Wired talked to JPL engineer Teddy Zanettos to learn about the challenges of designing a helicopter for Mars. There is no manual, there's no instruction sheet, no, you know, NASA hasn't done this before. It's an evolution of baby stepping and, and tackling the next biggest technical challenge each step along the way. In the month of ingenuity and getting uh, our flights has been on one side of the screen putting up our models and saying this is what we think a helicopter should do based off of everything we've done here on Earth. And then on the right side of the screen we put up the actual results and we say okay this is what this is what Ingenuity actually did and you, you line them on top of each other and it's an almost perfect match. On the parachute, we are coming up on the One of the biggest flight challenges engineers had to face were the aerodynamics of Mars. The Martian atmosphere is 1% the density of Earth's atmosphere. You know, you move your hands around here on Earth, you can kind of feel the hair on, on your hands moving around as a result of every action as an equal opposite reaction, right? You feel you're actually pushing the wind. Imagine now 1% of, of that sensation on your hand. That's how little air we're talking about. Flying on Mars is like flying a helicopter at 100,000 feet on Earth. So there's not a lot of air to produce thrust to move up. So to give yourself the easiest job possible, you want to keep your vehicle light and that kind of means around the area of two kilograms. Ingenuity weighs less than your domesticated cat. The blades have to be compact enough to fit into the rover, but also fast enough for lift. That means that your blades can just spin, you know, around, you know, we're talking about 1,900, 2,800 RPM. That's super fast. Compare that to the rotation per minute of helicopter blades here on Earth, which spin between 400 to 500 RPM. Most people are familiar with a single rotor spinning and then a tail rotor that counteracts your yaw torque. Those two rotor systems, if they counter rotate, they can cancel out that yaw instead um, and then can also produce thrust on top of each other and still give you positional control. In its first five flights, Ingenuity's flown a combined 91 feet, which altogether would be about the height of an eight story building. Another surprising aerodynamic challenge was low gravity. It's actually nice that the gravity is less uh, on the surface of Mars. It's about one third of what we have here on Earth. And that makes it easier for the vehicle to actually get up off the surface. That makes it difficult for here on, the, for here on Earth, though, because how do we test that? Uh, we don't have anti-gravity technology where there's no way to cancel out the gravitational field. So engineers built a gravity offload system to replicate the low gravity during the testing phase. You can think of it like a high-tech fishing reel. Uh, we attach that several stories above the helicopter in our vacuum chamber. And there's a control loop that many, many times a second, it just senses how much torque it feels. That torque over a fixed radius pulley gives you the tension on the line. And we just have a controller that's dialing in that torque to give you a fixed tension. And that fixed tension cancels out the difference in gravity between Earth and Mars. Engineers also had to make sure that Ingenuity was stable enough to take off and land without falling over. When, after we first landed on the surface was, for, for the Ingenuity team, was to do our, our kind of flight zone selection. That whole site selection process was very particular about the number of rocks uh, at, at certain distances apart as different sizes of rocks to give us the best you know, location to, to fly on. And what about those infamous Martian dust storms? You ready? Ready! Hollywood tends to exaggerate a little bit the capabilities of Mars windstorm. Because of that 1% density, there's not a lot of matter hitting you, right? And there's not a lot of momentum being imparted upon you because of that. So, so we're not too concerned about a, a dust storm coming and knocking us over. Not only did engineers need to make Ingenuity fly, they needed to design a way to keep the craft from freezing every night. A lot of, no pun intended energy, uh, but a lot of time was put into designing the thermal management system for Ingenuity. Mars can get to negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and engineers had to protect the brain of Ingenuity, which holds its camera, computing boards, and batteries. 
The solution, wrapping the box that holds the Ingenuity's brain with two layers of this shiny golden material. We have our metallized polyamide film. That's our inner insulation layer. And then we have an outer insulation layer. By preventing those circulation currents from flowing, you minimize how much heat winds up leaking out to the outside surface and you keep your precious components warm throughout the very, very cold nights. Beyond just keeping the battery warm, engineers also needed to keep the battery charged. The solution was a solar panel. That's our, our font of energy. That's where Ingenuity recharges. It's a rectangular panel, and it's about a foot long, you know, I would say a little less than a half a foot wide. Whenever photons are hitting the surface of the solar panel, we're, we're taking those in and we're, we're, we're shoving them into the battery. You'll see three rows of solar cells on top, and those three rows all combine to give us all the energy that we need to charge soul after soul. One single cell of a battery is about half the life of a cell phone battery. And that's what we use every single flight, every single day, every single moment to keep ourselves warm, to, to run telecom, uh, to, to, to speak back with, you know, mission control here on the ground. And finally, engineers had to figure out how to control the helicopter from roughly 200 million miles away. So we have our solar panel with our little telecom antenna on top, and that is our link back to mission control here at NASA JPL. All of the data and commands sent here from the ground, we uplink that to the orbiters. Orbiters then relay that to the rover, and then the rover sends that to our base station, which then sends it back over to, to the helicopter. Everything that Ingenuity does on Mars is done autonomously by code and algorithms. And the engineers at JPL wait for its transmitted data to see if their calculations were correct. That's what they're doing here. This is Downlink. We've pulled in data products from Mars 2020. Little insider baseball here is depending on the size of the data, we, we sometimes know how things went. We're sitting there at our stations waiting for the first bits and then the last bits to, to hit the deep space network, to hit the receiving stations here on Earth, to then get forwarded over to JPL. Once, once we verify data is down and, and our pilot has confirmed that we've flown, then we can celebrate and say, yes, now we know for sure. However, there are even some challenges that you can't prepare for. After we were dropped, the rover took some very nice images of Ingenuity and specifically of the solar panel. And we noticed that, yeah, there was definitely some dust there that we think may have accumulated either after we were deployed. And we're looking right now, we're doing the, the data mining and analysis. One of the cool aspects of having all this data is you can go back looking at how did the solar panel do before flight one, before we really started sh shaking the system, uh, and then after flight one, how does that change? That is definitely one, one of the interesting aspects of having an aircraft uh, is that you're not physically static. You maybe can use your propulsion system to try and clean off your solar panel, but, but we'll see, work to go. When Ingenuity flies again, it'll kick off its operational demonstrations phase, where the craft will capture images and scout above the Martian terrain. We've proven that humanity can fly on Mars. We're trying to push that envelope even further and learn as many lessons as we can. Eventually, parts will fail. It's going to happen, right? Uh, we are using COTS parts. We are not as reliable as the rover. We are not as reliable as a Class A mission that, that's designed to survive months and months and months, right? So it's going to happen. We're ready for it. We'll look back to these three points that, uh, you know, we've flown, we got the data down, and it's not a fluke. We did it five plus however many uh, we're lucky enough to do in the operational demo. So, uh, you know, as happy as can be. It's been a dream come true, and, and we're just trying to continue that as long as we can. When the operational demonstration's over, uh, wherever wherever she touches down for the last time, that that's that'll be where she stays. In terms of the long-term future, she's already home. Uh, so that, that, that's that's where where ingenuity is meant to be. I can't wait to see what comes of this, and 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 what you know humanity can do as a result of this. Um, you know, the idea of being able to carry meaningful science payloads in the future, maybe one day helping the first astronauts that land on the red planet. And we're excited that Ingenuity has now enabled that.